morning, Dennis. I can barely hear me. All right, make sure it's loud enough because some of our folks wear hearing aids. Okay. Wake Dennis up. Good morning, Dennis. That's it. Thank you.
Buenos dias and good morning. It's a joy for us to come together to worship and celebrate God's presence in our lives and in this world. I want to welcome and greet, if there's anybody in the parking lot listening in, you're welcome. Those who'll be watching the video later, you're welcome. And we're also live streaming, and so you're also welcome. It's a lot more complicated than when I started ministry. <laughs> Uh, we do want to continue to follow our safety protocols with masks when we're on the main floor. In your bulletin, there are these little blue slips of paper. Please register your presence with us, and it's helpful if you include contact information if we need it. And also, I encourage you, if you have prayer requests or such, put that on the back, because I do look at them each week, and it's part of my prayers. Uh, we are going to, of course, maintain our social distancing uh, we haven't had anybody get sick out of our worship, and I really want us to maintain that wonderful record and how we're doing things. Uh, we will be having a Christmas Eve service. It'll be in person at 7 o'clock. We're not going to light candles for each other because that seems very dangerous this year. Uh, but we'll also we'll get together for some music and some wonderful scripture to celebrate God's presence in our world and life. Also, it will be live streamed. If you don't want to come, you can watch it in, on live. It will also be recorded, so you can watch the video later, either on Facebook, YouTube, or our website. And we'll also put it out into the parking lot if someone wants to stay in their car and try to worship on uh, Christmas Eve. And so again, we have lots of options. I also want to remind everybody that during this December, we do collect the Christmas joy gift. It's why I think one of the more significant offerings that we collect as a denomination. Half of it goes to uh, support uh, church workers who get in trouble, which includes pastors, missionaries, and musicians and such. The other half is used to support racial ethnic colleges and schools. Uh, Manal School is a recipient of that right up in Albuquerque. And so I encourage everybody, let's be generous. You can give by dropping it into the boxes along each of the aisles. You can mail it in, or you can also, also available on our giving, electronic giving site. And so lots and lots of options. Let us uh, prepare for worship. There's a meditation at the beginning of the bulletin.
let us worship God. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, through the mountains tremble with its tumult. Be still and know that I am God. I am excited among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning.
Let us continue our worship with prayer. Lord, what a blessed and yet weary time this is for your people. Be with each of us as we walk through these days of Advent and with those whom you have placed in our care. Give us both rest and strength to help others wait for, long for, and anticipate peace, hope, joy, and the love that only the arrival of Jesus can bring. Place within us a sweet longing and anticipation in our own Advent waiting, in our hearts of all, so that they may hear your promises spoken through the words of your prophets of old and your servants now. Open the eyes of all souls so that they might see the light grows ever stronger as these days draw nearer to your promise on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us in temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let us confess... Give me. <laughs> Let us confess our sins to God, knowing that he is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all. We give thanks, O God, because you are unchanging, because your concern for justice and righteousness is so strong, and you came in human form to share that concern with us in person. Forgive us, O oh God, for the loving God, we confess. Anyway. Loving God, we confess our sins against you and one another. We pray that you will fill us with your light. May we live our lives in your name as true disciples. May the light of Christ show us your way. May the love of Christ overflow from our lives to others. May the life of Christ be our model as we seek to be your people. Amen. 
Friends, hear the good news. Jesus died and rose again, overthrowing the powers of sin and death, and he did it for the sake of the world. We are enslaved no longer by the power of darkness. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ. All our sins are forgiven, and we are set free to follow Jesus. Believing and trusting in God, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and released from sin's bondage to follow Jesus. Thanks be to God. What does scripture teach us about the nature of our God? There is but one living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving inequity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seeks him. As we gather around the Advent wreath today, we rejoice that Christmas is a time of prayer and of open hearts when we sing of joy. Christmas is a time of worship, the moment when the busiest of us pause and wonder. Christmas happens when God comes to us in love through Jesus Christ and fills us with love for all humankind. First letter of John, chapter four, verses nine through 11. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent God's only child into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent the child to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. For the coming of this light is love. Such great love helps us to love God and one another. The color of this candle is purple, symbolizing the majesty of Christ, who rules in the power of love. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you that Jesus showed your love for every person babies and children, old people and young, sick people and those who are strong, rich people and those who are poor. Come to us as Christmas approaches and let love be born in our hearts as you were born into the world on Christmas Day. Amen.
story today, a Christmas story, but it's not the Christmas story from the Bible. It's one of those could-be-true stories that people sometimes write when they wonder how it might have been for a, something that happened in the Bible. And this is one that happened in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. In Jerusalem long ago, there lived a boy named Matthew. His father was a Hebrew merchant who did very well with his business of buying and selling things. They lived in a fine house with servants to take care of it. Matthew and his father were especially close because his mother had died and the two of them made a little family. One day, when Matthew came home from visiting a friend, the house seemed strangely quiet. Father, are you here? Why is it so quiet? No one answered. But his father's oldest servant, Jacob, came. The kind old man laid his hand on Matthew's shoulder, and he said, Matthew, your father is not here, and I do not know when he may come home. A Roman official wanted to speak with him, and some soldiers came to take him there. He asked me to take you to Bethlehem. We should leave soon. The soldiers may come back. Matthew's uncle Isaac owned a small inn in Bethlehem. It seemed a poor place to a boy who had lived in such a fine city house. But the family welcomed him. Everyone had work to do at the inn, and it became Matthew's job to take care of the family's few animals and keep the stable clean. He liked the stable. It was quiet there and calm and peaceful. He often slept there at night because the inn was such a busy, noisy place. There were so many people crowding into Bethlehem. Matthew heard that it had something to do with an order given by the Roman emperor one very, very busy day. He was in the courtyard when Uncle Isaac was turning people away who wanted a place to stay because the inn was full. Two of those people especially caught Matthew's attention. The woman reminded him of his mother. They looked so tired and worried that he wished for some way to help them. 
he heard the woman say, Joseph, we must find shelter soon. The baby is coming. Are you having a baby? said Matthew. The woman smiled. Her smile was beautiful, but her voice was tired. Yes, dear, he is coming tonight. Do you know a place where we might stay? Yes, I do, said Matthew. Come to my stable. I'll bring clean straw, and I'll ask my Aunt Ruth for what you might need. Matthew left them alone to rest in the stable. But that night, the inn was more crowded and noisy than ever, and he couldn't sleep. He came across the courtyard to the stable. A brilliant star guided his way. Today, we call it the Star of Bethlehem. In the stable, Mary said, Come, Matthew, come see little baby Jesus. He is God's own son. God's son, Matthew thought. Could this really be the Messiah that my people have waited to see for so long? When he came close and looked carefully at the baby, he knew in his heart he knew that this was God's Messiah. He knelt down beside the manger where the baby lay. Little Jesus, he said, I know, I know that you are the Messiah. I will always worship you. And all his life, he did. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord. Thank you for coming to earth to be our Messiah, too. We will always worship you. Amen.
Let us pray together. O Holy One, who was born in Bethlehem, that we may dwell in peace. We praise you, O gracious God. Your love for us overwhelms. Like a blazing fire on a cold day, so we are drawn to worship together, and some in person and others not, sharing the warmth of Christian fellowship. What a delight it is to be here in your presence, to be moved by the music of worship, called and encowered, encouraged by the power of your word. We have so much to thank you for, O oh God. We are grateful for safe travel, for your mercy is with us on our journeys and at our many stops along the way until you bring us safely to our final destination, our eternal home. We thank you for family and friends. How fitting to remember them during this Christmas season of celebration. How appropriate to appreciate all that you have sent our way to touch our lives and help sustain us throughout the years. At times, however, selfishness and ego damages our relationships. Therefore, we seek your healing hand that there may be reconciliation, restoration of hurt. And may we seek your healing hand to heal our damaged feelings and help us forego the right to revenge as you have forgiven us. We thank you for our church, for the fellowship of all gathered here by your grace. Thank you, Lord, for all who labor and serve, who do the many tasks of ministry, and who make this church home their family. We thank you for those who give of financial resources, for those who sacrifice that this church might grow and fulfill our mission to serve this community. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness echoes and reflects yours, for we are truly and richly blessed. This day, eternal God, we are in anticipation. As we celebrate that you have come and you will come again, by your grace and presence in our lives, we hope to be ready, to be found diligent doing the work to which we have been called. We know, merciful God, that the joyful glee of the season can also be a sharp and wounding barb, painful to those who grieve. We pray for those who suffer, and may they receive your peace that is beyond our human understanding. May your comfort so fill and surround us all that we live into your joy, your peace, your hope, and abiding presence, even amid life's difficulties, disappointments, and storms. O oh Lord, whose light shines into our darkness, hear the silent prayers of your people. We thank you, Lord, for hearing us, for loving us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
The Old Testament reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and 16. Now when King David was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The second reading is from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. For most of my adult life, a large part of Christmas has been about making plans. During college, arranging for a ride to spend Christmas at home, or finding a job during the Christmas break, or getting together with my friends. Later, when I operated office product and stationery stores, Christmas gift merchandise was an important part of that business. I needed to plan my budget for advertising and gift items well in advance. It had to be ready by May so that I could negotiate with vendors at the New York stationery show. All of that planning was essential for my business to grow and succeed. And I had to do it every year. This year, Christmas is not going to be like what we're used to for any of us. Our familiar plans, traditions, gatherings aren't going to happen. And, and so what do we make of all that? In 2 Samuel, we read about David making plans for some construction. He had come a long way 
rising from shepherd boy to king, under his leadership consolidating Israel into a nation, and building himself a nice and costly palace of cedar. And so it seemed the right time now to build a temple to honor God. So David checked in with the prophet Nathan to confirm his plans about building this grand temple. And Nathan quickly agreed that yes, indeed, that's a very good idea. In fact, it all seemed to be so sensible that the prophet didn't even bother checking out with God before he spoke. But that night, after having approved David's and supported David's plan, in a prophetic vision, David's building permit was revoked. Starting verse 4. And that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in tent and tabernacle. Did I ever say a word saying, why have, not, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Sometimes, don't we get so wrapped up in our own plans, desires, and expectations that we assume they must all be God's will and that surely our pet project and programs have God's full blessings. In fact, so sure that we may stop listening and paying attention to the Lord. But in our text, God reasserts his sovereignty and rule. Verse 8. Now, therefore, you shall say to my servant David... Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. Notice that God refers to David as my servant David, not the king. Now truly David is loved, blessed, and called by God, but the Lord is still in charge, not David. It's never the creature's place to try to direct and control the creator. Therefore, any temple building will be done God's way, in God's time, and not according to the plans and blueprints drawn up by David. Just like grace, God accomplishes the planning and the heavy lifting, not us. As believers and disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called and invited to join in and participate following God's will, mission, and purpose. And it's never about us telling God how to fulfill our plans and our agenda. Now, the issue is not that God's being difficult or obstinate, but that God is up to something far better and more marvelous. Starting verse 10. I will make for you a great name. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, did you catch this? just a string of promises in all of these I will assurances? And now this is the best part. The Lord flatly rejects David's plans because God has something far beyond and even better than David's wildest ideas, which of course was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. When God chose to be human in the person of Jesus, whose family descended through David. David won't be building a house for God. Because, in fact, God intends to build David into a house. Not a human-built temple, but a dynasty. The family lineage through which Jesus Christ came as the promised Messiah. There's also another meaning or wordplay on this word or idea of house. God 
won't dwell in a structure of stone and brick made by humans because God chooses to dwell in flesh and blood, in human hearts, among the people of God gathered in God's name. Or as the Apostle Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know that you are God's temple, that the Spirit dwells within you? God is holy and you are that temple. You're not going to build me a temple because I'm going to build you into a temple. Which means the temple is the gift and grace of the Lord. And it's not something we accomplish by trying harder. It's about a shift in focus to reshift our perspective to the divine, to what God is doing and join in God's work project, God's purpose, and God's agenda. The point is a critical and powerful change in our understanding and perspective. It's about drawing closer and cooperating with God's grace and letting the Holy Spirit guide us to refocus on the works and will of God by embracing this truth that God is good and his promises are sure. Just as the prophet Isaiah writes in chapter 26, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. It's all grace. As God opens our eyes to see in a new perspective, as Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It all really comes down to what do we truly trust and actually believe? Am I absolutely certain and am I entirely confident that God is good, that God is powerful and does have it all worked out and that in the end, God will surely accomplish every bit of it. If I do believe and trust that all of that's true and reliable, then it doesn't depend on us, on our good works or accomplishments. But rather, our task is to get in line with God's will and try not to get in the way too much. When I am most faithful and spiritually attuned in every situation, regardless of whatever goes going on, the right questions to ask include, where can I perceive the Lord in this? What might God be up to in this? And how can this serve to fulfill the will and purpose of the Lord? What could God be intending to show me through all of this? And how will God transform this challenge into a blessing? Our ultimate concern and our focus, both of those need to be on God and not limited or governed by our desires or our agenda. For our most carefully constructed plans and preparations are really no more than a candle flickering in the wind. As we read in James chapter 4. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while then vanishes. Instead you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live to do this or that. We don't know what tomorrow holds for us, but we do know who holds us and who holds our tomorrow. And that is our hope and our secure assurance. It is resetting our minds, our self-understanding and perspective away from the stuff of this world. Our immediate concerns are human things and learning to perceive and notice divine things. God's gracious presence happening all around us. And wait upon the Lord 
and allow space for healing and hope by looking for where God is already present and already at work. It's learning to say, not my will, but thy will be done. It is to focus and trust in God rather than ourselves. It's learning to see with gratitude and have an awareness of God and saying, Lord, you take charge. You enter and you rule throughout. For to follow Jesus is to turn from our point of view and to take up God's point of view and make that our own. Truly, the good news is that God loves us. God provides for us and is doing great things with us. And that God has something far better in mind for us, better than even the best plans that we might devise. My experience in life is that when God does lead us faithfully, we usually only get to see a few steps at a time. I've never experienced God laying out the whole plan before me. But rather, God seems to delight in gradually leading, gently, lovingly nudging, step by step when I'm willing to pause, pray, and listen, and how abundantly I've been blessed when I've chosen to obey. So how do these two passages apply to us today? On this last Sunday of Advent, the text suggests two major lessons for our consideration. First, we can get so locked into our own planning, demands, and desires that we may miss recognizing and appreciating the true blessings and gracious gifts we're receiving from God. This can be especially be true at Christmas time. With so many cultural and familiar expectations and pressures, when we typically run ourselves and those around us ragged trying to achieve the perfect Christmas celebration, when our plans, our mem memories, expectations, and assumptions may cause us to doubt or reject God's surprising us. The incredible and wonderful, the unexpected that God lovingly intends for us to receive as his gift. Too often we foolishly and mistakenly suppose and assume that a good and meaningful Christmas is something we can achieve rather than the truth. God's truth and abiding love that it is entirely a gift graciously given by our God. In short, we're really not in charge, which leads to the second, that God is sovereign, not our plans, not our intentions, not our desires or our agendas. Even our best ideas and desires for doing and accomplishing good will fall short, can become corrupted and even destructive if in our pride, self-determination, and insistence, we ignore or bypass listening for the Lord our God. Just like David's plans, rejected by God for something far better. In December of 1914, Thomas Edison's New Jersey laboratory burned entirely to the ground. The next morning, as he walked among the still smoldering rubble, where so many of his amazing inventions had originated. Edison said, there is great value in a disaster. All our mistakes burned up, and now we can start anew. Or as Paul wrote in Philippians 3, this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. No, our Christmas this year is not going to be what we're used to. 
But since so much of our busy planning and regular activities won't happen, perhaps this will allow us to focus more on what does really matter. With a quieter, less hectic and demanding Christmas this year, rather than complaining and worrying about what isn't and what cannot be, let us instead pour ourselves into the many blessings we do have. Considering my own life, the changes and events of my own history, my planning and plotting toward the future I had intended to build, more than ever, I am so grateful for those times when God said, no, Norm. No, I will not leave you doing science in a laboratory. No, I will not leave you working in the business world. I have something for you that will fit you much better. And what an amazing, gracious, wise, and wonderful God we serve. Did you know that back in March, the elders on session had a retreat, and we spent the day talking, praying, and making plans for the church? The coronavirus was just starting to appear in news reports, and so the elders decided we should discontinue the after-fellowship worship for now until we knew more about it and this virus thing was resolved. This past week, I looked back at the notes that I prepared for that retreat. My comments addressed to the session included this statement. We must improve our communication and use of technology and must be able to make videos and live stream our worship services. That's a quote. And then two weeks later, we were locked down by the governor's order and have had to rely on making critical worship videos. Isn't it remarkable how abundantly our church has been blessed as God transformed a challenge and difficulty forced upon us into an amazing opportunity to change and to grow in new ways. The Christian life is not about us trying to build our lives. It's about God in us, God in charge of our lives, God building us, God accomplishing far better and more than we could ever figure out. It's about Advent, the coming of Jesus Christ into our lives. Or as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians 3, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that is the word of God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, according to your mercy, we ask that we would hear, receive, welcome, and live into your grace for us, your truth. Help us, Lord, to truly recognize what's good in Christmas, its meaning, and how we can live more faithfully with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and join in our closing hymn 132. Thank you.
And now by the grace, the peace and mercy of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Oh.